Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today in what we've called Transforming the World Through Reflections. My name is Melissa Shepard Williams and I welcome you to this opportunity to think out loud about creating the conditions for healing. This time our focus is art and freedom. I am so thankful deeply honored to be in the presence of this amazing person who will guide us in this reflection process. This is Valentino Dixon. Mr. Dixon is someone who has had an experience that unfortunately many men in this country, many people in this country continue to experience. Thankfully, his story is one that will inspire, continue to inspire because of what he moved through. Many of you may be aware of his story already. He, in 1991, was wrongly convicted of a crime and 27 years of his life were spent incarcerated. Throughout that time, art played a strong role in moving through that experience and, and moving towards yet another one of freedom. I welcome you, I thank you, Mr. Dixon. Let's talk, let's talk. How are you doing today? Hi, Melissa. Hi. <laughs> I'm all right, I'm blessed. Oh, and the work behind you is just amazing. Right before we started. Thank you recording we were just talking about the art it is amazing it is amazing so i'm curious about how you've been doing through this pandemic i i did i would like to think that i i did a 27 year uh quarantine mm. okay and so I was used to being confined and restricted, you know, and restricted. Yes. So during this, okay. And so I've tried to use my experience and my voice to help people through this process, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, many blessings has came from this. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn about ourselves. Um, a lot of reflecting that we can do to help us navigate to the next level in our life, the next yes. uh, journey, the next process, yes. you know, because, you know, and life is about stages, you know, we, we grow in stages and it's extremely important to reflect and to, you know, um, look at life from a different perspective, you know, because mm -hmm. once you're okay. deprived of something, you know, you really don't. You really don't value it the way you should until you're, it's taken away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So people are people are experiencing, you know, just a little bit of what I've had to experience those twenty-seven years. Twenty-seven years. And, and it's okay because yeah, twenty-seven years. It's okay. I'm not. I'm not crying about it. I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. None of that stuff. The reason being is this. In life, all of us is going to be challenged with something. We don't get to decide what the challenge or test is going to be. It could be a death in the family. It could be a health issue. You know, uh, it could be a loss of a job. It could be a, a, a divorce. You know, many things that we're going to be tested with. And so with each person's challenge and test is... Uh, survive 
and thrive and be the best person that they can be, be you know because of that misfortune yes you know and i mean the first seven years of, of my imprisonment i didn't do much with my time but stress and worry and wallow in pity pretty much you know because prison is this prison is designed to break your spirit okay and it, it pretty much did just that mm. and i have an uncle to a wonderful man who said hey you're an artist i said uncle i haven't drawn in 10 years or painted he said what's your artist i said i don't know about <laughs> that he says well he says well you may have to you may have to draw your way out of prison i said what do you mean Wow. He says, if you can reclaim, if you can reclaim your talent, you can reclaim your life. Okay. And he sent me some color pencils. See these pencils. He sent me a bunch of color pencils. Yes. And he sent me some white paper. And I procrastinated for a little while, you know. And then I said, you know what? Let me sit down and and, and draw. Because I mean, I wasn't doing anything with myself. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I didn't want my life to end that way, you know. And I had forty years for something I didn't do, and all my appeals had been denied. Okay, and the crazy thing is, is this: I had eight eyewitnesses that came forth and told the authorities that I was innocent because this shooting occurred at a restaurant, and it was over ninety witnesses. Okay, all of those witnesses were disregarded and turned away. And the person responsible for the crime felt so bad that he turned himself into the police and, still. and confessed. And they kicked him out of the police station and told him that an arrest had already been made. So the evidence existed just days after I was arrested. So I, I find myself going to trial 10 months later with a public defender because I couldn't afford a, a good attorney. And this public defender failed to call any of those witnesses or introduce the confession to the jury. Jury never knew a man confessed. Mm -hmm. And when I complained to the judge, he told me to sit down and I should be grateful to have such a good, a fine attorney. So all my appeals were denied at the appellate level, the court of appeals, the Supreme Court level, it went to the federal courts. They all were denied, even though these witnesses statements existed and this confession existed. And well, what the courts do is this. Often, the courts protect each other and rubber stamp cases. Okay. And this was a clear case of my constitutional rights being violated, you know, that I didn't receive a fair trial. However, when careers are at stake and people don't want to be embarrassed, they just don't know how to admit that, hey, we made a mistake here. Right. You know. And this is why, this is why you hear individuals, you know, men and women serving 10, 20, 30 years for crimes they didn't commit. This is the reason, you know, people in the legal field tend to cover for the, you know, each other. They do it in hospitals too. I mean, you know. Everywhere. Everywhere. Everybody wants to just like have a career. Yeah. People just want to have a career. They don't want to. They don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers, okay? And so when my uncle inspired me, you know, a light bulb went off. And I oh. said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to draw myself out of prison. And I'm going to have to take my skill level as far as it can go so that I can get some type of national attention on my artwork, which will bring attention to my wrongful conviction. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, right after, in fact, right after the police arrested me, they took my car and my clothes and said, if I fired a weapon, they would know. The problem is, is they tested these items in the lab and never turned over the results. You know, so here I am oh, in man. prison, drawing up to 10, you know, I, I'm in prison now. I started drawing up to 10 hours a day, every day for the last 20 years of my time in prison. And Hello. I walk, you know, and I and I was in one of the worst prisons, Attica Correctional Facility. Okay. And, but eventually my skill level got to where I was able to produce things, drawings like this. Wow. Wow. You know. Mm. Uh, and so 
something like this. Beautiful. Oh. You know, all original, all original designs. Don't ask me where my mind was at when I was thinking, you know, what I was thinking. That's know. what I was wondering about. Oh my goodness, that is so beautiful. Yeah, and then I would like, I, you know, I like to switch it up where I, you know, I cover everything pretty much. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, and here's an abstract piece. Mm-hmm. Wow. Another abstract. So I became known as the artist in Attica. The artist in Okay. And artist Attica. Everybody knew me as the artist in Attica because all I did was drew every day up to 10 hours. Oh, that is so amazing. Yeah. Please. So the warden. The warden came to me and he says, hey, Valentino, would you draw my favorite golf hole? And I never drew, I never golfed before. I'm a black kid from the inner city. We don't golf. Like, but I drew his favorite golf hole and he loved it. And another neighbor of mine says, hey, Valentino, you need to draw more golf holes. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so they brought me some, some old di golf digest magazines. Mm -hmm. And I started drawing golf courses. It was weird. Okay. Oh, yeah. Never golfed before, but Never I started drawing golf, golf courses. And here you are drawing right. golf courses. Oh, wow. That's Never golf. Yeah. So eventually I got creative. And I started, like, right here you have two frogs on the golf course. He's holding a ball. He's <laughs> holding a club. Let me see if you can see that. Yes, yes. It's a golf yes. course in the background. I see it. Oh. Okay. Oh. And, right. Telling and I did a picture Telling right stories. here with Tiger. Yeah. And then I took, when Tiger Woods won the Masters, I, I drew him. <laughs> and I put the Masters in his shirt. <laughs> wow. That's wow. Okay. But this, this, this picture is the one I'm most famous for. This is the 12th hole of Augusta. I saw that. Yes. And this is what Michelle Obama purchased for Barack Obama for Barack Christmas. Obama. Mm -hmm. This is a copy of it. Wow. Anybody that's interested, I have these on my website at ValentinoDixon.com. That's beautiful. Yes, definitely. Your, your website, we, we will make sure. So I've actually, for five years, I produced about 300 golf drawings. Okay. It's got the attention of Golf Digest magazine. They published a story and then they got the attention of the Golf Channel. Okay. And I did an interview with the Golf Channel while I was in prison and it got nominated for Emmy Award. Okay. Then from there, then from there, uh, Georgetown got involved, Georgetown Law School. Okay. Yes. And for six months, I worked with, the, yeah, for six months, I worked with the students and they decided to do a documentary. And they got the prosecutor to admit that he withheld the physical evidence that uh, cleared me of this crime. And so I walked out of jail after 27 years. After 27 years of your life. And that, yes. that time, that time you, you fine tune your, your skills as an artist in ways that you did not expect. Never, never in a million years would I have imagined that I could reach this level. But not only just a, as an artist, as a human being. As a human okay? being. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because I also read up. I read up to like nine hundred books when I was in prison that time. During that time, I read everything. You know, and it was, it was, it was words and, and, and expressions that invigorated my spirit. Mm. Okay, that kept me strong. And I realized that, hey, there's a 10-year-old kid right now that's battling cancer, okay? Yeah. Or somebody just passed away in a car accident. So I'm in a six-by-eight cell saying, you know what? You're a blessed man. It's kind of crazy to people. They say, wow, you know, we have to count our blessings. And that's the lesson here. Perspective. You know. Perspective. Yes. Because without, without this trust and belief, it, God was in that cell with me, you know, because most of these drawings I look after I got done with them, but I was just like, how did you do that? How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So yeah, arts, I'm like, well, how, how did you... the arts the arts sustained you in so many ways while you were there? Yeah, that all day long. The art, yeah, the art and prayer, those two things. Mm -hmm. You know, and I knew my day was going to come. I didn't know when, but I knew it was going to come. And I had to, you know, will myself to stay strong. Yeah. And this is what we have to do in life. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about those first seven years when you said it was just, this is before your uncle inspired you to draw yourself out of prison. Yes. What, what, would you, what would you share about those first seven years? Well, what I would say is that I believe I had given up on life. Mm. Okay. I, I, I just, so I had given up on life. When I say I had given up, I was not doing anything with my time. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was feeling sorry for myself. And I also watched a movie called Shawshank Redemption. One of my right? favorites. And, and a great movie. Yes. Great movie. And it was, Morgan, yeah. Morgan Freeman, Morgan Freeman narrated the movie, even though he was an actor. You know, he said that Andy had two choices. And Andy is the main character. He said, either get busy living or get busy dying. Mm. All right. That resonated with me. Mm. So I had to get busy living no matter where I was. And I was in a six by eight cell. Wow. And I had to turn that six by eight cell into a science lab. Wow. A recreation of yourself. It sounds like. Yes. You know. Wow. Yes. And you, you know, you don't just become, you know, you don't just become uh, a, re a, re a refined person overnight. It takes time. You grow in stages. You know, we grow in stages. Yes, absolutely. You know, oh, and I realized the more that I read, the more I realized my purpose in life, okay? And mm -hmm. what I was put on this planet to do, you know? And I was in prison teaching guys how to get their GED, you know? Oh. You know, they would line up at my cell and have, you know, issues going on. They needed solutions and answers. At any given time, I had five guys waiting in line to ask me a particular question about some issue, you know, because I had read so many books. Just throw up a, a subject and I can pretty much give you some advice on it. Good advice, too, not just any type of advice, you know. Mm -hmm. And if I don't know something, I'm going to go research it. Yes. So it really, it really... I, I don't like giving out misinformation. Yeah. You were cultivating this thirst for learning more and more and more and passing it on yes all all day long you know all day long because uh, things happen to people in, in in this life right and they don't know what to do people don't know where to turn to and you know sometimes you just need somebody to listen to them yes. and even sometimes not necessarily give advice just to listen and say that it's going to be okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what you made me think of when you said that is this African proverb, Ubuntu, I am because we are. We just need somebody to witness our lives. And you, you, yes. you, you provide most definitely, you provided that to them in so many ways. You were, you were there, you were there listening, you were there counseling. You know, Melissa, they used to call me the Black Dr. Phil. <laughs> Yeah, some even you know even some of the guys so even some of the guards would have issues that they would come speak to me about family issues. Coming to Valentine. <laughs> have you ever seen uh, the artist Bob Ross, the white guy with the afro? Okay. Yes. So when I was in prison, I used to watch Bob Ross. Very ins inspirational. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, when I when I when I get released one day, I'm gonna have my own drawing show. And I'm gonna call it Draw and Talk with Me. Ooh. Right. 
Yeah, and I'm going to teach people how to draw, and we're going to talk about something important. Mm. Okay. Yes. So I walked out of prison. When I walked out of prison, I connected with a young film guy, a videographer. I purchased my own cameras, my own lighting system. I said, "Hey, you know, I'm going to start teaching people how to draw, and I need you to be my film guy." He was so inspired by my story. He says, let's go. Wherever you got to go, I'm coming with you. Let's do it. All right. So I got, I got a good year. I only been out of jail two, two years and four months. Okay. So the first, since the pandemic, for the first year and a half, we did 36 shows. Okay. And because I was speaking all over the world, I ran to a lot of famous people, a lot of, you know, influential people. You know, and I got a lot of drawn talk to me shows that's, for example, four of my guests was Hall of Fame athletes, you know, football player, uh, cowboy, professional cowboy, a uh, professional golfer. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to draw and talk with a heart doctor. You know, what can he teach us about the heart? Right. Okay. Right. I've done a draw and talk. I've drawn a draw and talk with uh, 30 school teachers. You know, how can we make the school system more effective? That's beautiful. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've drawn, I've done a draw and talk with, with students. I've, draw, I've done a draw and talk with a homeless person. Okay. How did this person become homeless? You know, mm -hmm. what could they teach us? Yes. You know, very important. Very, yes. very important. You know, Everybody this has this a person story. has a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and I formulated about 20 questions for my guests. So we're, I'm teaching them how to draw something. At the end of the show, I put up my picture and they put up their picture. Because I teach them how to draw a rose or whatever, a tree, whatever they can think of. Mm -hmm. So if you, go to, if you go to YouTube, you'll see, just go to Draw and Talk with me, Valentino Dixon, and you'll see 20 episodes up there. Wow. And so as I'm listening to you, here's what I'm learning. Being... Being in, 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 in prison all those years, transforming your life, you have, you, have been, you have been inviting others to transform theirs too. Yes, and, most definitely. And then the, the draw and talk, I love that idea, the draw and talk. I mean, you were inviting people to, to think out loud with you and, and, and feel heard. You know, and that's, yes. that's a precious gift. The more I'm listening to you, I hear a sense of purpose driving you. And, oh, yeah. And the art's at the center of it. Well, something, something has to be at the center of all of our lives. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Something has to be at the center of all of our lives. And that might not be art. Maybe something else. It may be uh, mentoring kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for me, it's artwork. The art allows me to expand across the board. Okay. And um, and just reach everybody. Yes. Even if you don't know how to draw, mm -hmm. you know, if you sit with me for half an hour, you'll be surprised what you can uh, what you can come up with. Mm -hmm. All of us have a hidden talent, you know, yeah. and I, you know, I, I believe all of us is, has an inner artist. I believe it. I believe it. You and I have had an opportunity to talk before today. And I, I, I know I shared with you that as a therapist, I work with artists every day. And it's been such uh, uh, an incredible learning experience to, to, to learn to learn about the, the language of their art making and how through that language, we come up with all kinds of metaphors for healing whatever it is that they're challenged by in, 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 in life. And so, yes, the, the, arts, the arts definitely serve us to learn about our pain and, and, and learn about our healing. And uh, I, I just am so thankful that you have engaged so many people in that process and you happen to be doing it with your art. 
And you know, who knew that you were gonna be drawing golf courses when you had never been golfing before? Not me. If, Not I, if, if, if you would have told if you would have told me ahead of time I was gonna be drawing golf courses and that was gonna be the one of the main reasons why I was free because of this golf art, you know, I would have told you you must be crazy, you must be insane. What do you mean? No way I'm gonna draw golf courses. What were you thinking about when you were drawing golf courses? I mean, what what was, if you recall, what what did well, you find? Yeah, well, because I had never drawn before, it reminded me of fishing. All right, I grew up in the inner city, and the only time I had some real peace was when my father took us fishing during the summer. Okay, then it was right back to the inner city where it's all of this craziness going on. Yeah. Okay, but. When I started drawing these golf courses, it was so serene and peaceful. It reminded me of fishing. It reminded me of the one time that I had some peace. Mm -hmm. So to you know, and there. Yes, and I fell in love with it. And I, and I drew golf golf courses every day for five years straight before I was released. And so you you gain a sense. You can't of, make this stuff up. You can't. You can't yeah. make it up. Like you can't even make this it one. Up. Even this big course right here. Can you see this yes. right here? I drew this yes. in prison. Wow. And that's in Dubai. Wow. And this one down here. Never would you have imagined. Oh wow! Look at those colors. Nope. They got a big one over here in this corner. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, mm -hmm. this, all of this came out of you during a time when, you know, you were you were going through well, life in, in Attica. In Attica. Let me say this. Yes. You know, in... I mean, I was inspired by so many things. I mean, watching Michael Jordan win six championships, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how, how does this happen? Because Michael, he willed himself to be the best player in the world, you know, and it was examples like that, that, so you know what, you need to, you're going to try to be the greatest artist to ever walk on this planet. And I don't know if I'm going to accomplish it or not, but that was my goal in that prison cell. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm curious about, about, you know, you told me that your, your uncle said, you need to draw yourself out of prison. And I'm wondering if your freedom came before you even left prison. My freedom came, I'm gonna say 20 years before I was released. Hmm. The minute I started putting pencil to paper and then my freedom came, because I was, I was not physically free, but I was mentally and emotionally free. Wow. The day that you set foot outside of prison, how do you put that into words? Well, because I had prepared myself for freedom and because I was already mentally free, it was not an adjustment, a big adjustment I had to make. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. You know, I, I, I kept up to date with technology. I knew what type of phone I wanted, <laughs> you know? And even though I had never used a computer, even though I never used a computer in my life, we didn't have any computers in prison. I learned the computer language before I walked out. I knew what a USB was, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, and, you were you know, creating the conditions for life outside. Most most definitely. I designed some websites while I was in my jail cell. Even though I never used a computer. Wow. You know, just from just from looking at magazines. Mm -hmm. You know, what do I want my homepage to look like on my website? You know, how I'm gonna market this site. Yes. You know, how, yeah. how I'm gonna cut down the clicks. How I'm gonna cut down all of these clicks so people can just click and buy and put in the cart. Wow. You know, all of these different things that yeah, all of the different things that make a great website. And that'll draw traffic to that site. I had all of this stuff, uh, you know, pretty much mapped out before I walked out of prison. 
to have a free mind. Yes, because we can't avoid challenges and obstacles and roads in the block and forks in the road. We can't avoid that. So you pretty much have to be one with it. When it comes, you embrace it and say, you know, I'm going to be one with this obstacle. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm going to conquer this thing. Yes. All right. And you see it happen time and time again. You know, I've seen a 90 year old, 98 year old woman running in a marathon. All right. You know, and in the same token, you might see to say another 90 year old woman that can't walk, you know. So, you know, the human spirit, the human mind can go to levels that we can never imagine that it could go. Right. Right. You're 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 so right. Yeah. And, and I wanted to be one of those persons. These are inspiring things, and you are one of these persons. You are. Thank and you. Valentina, one thing that struck me as I was listening to you um, is that when, when a people has inherited pain from one generation to the next, to the point of oppressing ourselves, believing the lies that the oppressor has told us about who we are, it takes so much to free ourselves, free our minds the way you did to see what needs to be done and do it. Well, let me just say this. If you go all the way back to slavery, imagine being born into slavery and then dying a slave. Imagine how that life would have been. Okay. So I looked at all of that. Imagine you know, being in, subjected to the Holocaust, okay? All of this human suffering that we've seen century after century after century. Mm -hmm. So mine was in a six by eight prison cell and people have came out of these places to become great people. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of legacy that I wanted for myself. And you're, and you're creating it. So... As we all move through this pandemic that, like you said earlier, uh, uh, is an experience of confinement that you, that you know in deeper ways because of being in prison for 27 years. Uh, in our humanness, we need to feel connection. We need to feel connection. And for so many people, it's so hard to go through this pandemic, especially if they don't have a sense of connection to others or don't have the resources, the technology to connect with people the way you and I are connecting right now, for example. You know, whoever was having a hard time before the pandemic, they're having a harder time right now. And hopefully, listening to you, you know, it, it will inspire us all to see how we make the most of what is. So that when we go to the other side of the pandemic, we go equipped in ways that we were not before the pandemic or, or, or in ways that we didn't realize that we are, you know, that the pandemic is showing us what we have inside to thrive. Definitely. To thrive. Definitely. Yes. And not all misfortune is bad. Mm -hmm. Some things need to happen in order to help us appreciate the smaller things in life, well, even the bigger things. What's your greatest joy right now? What's my greatest joy? Right now. Just being alive, being able to speak right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and not only that, and having a sane, a sane mind, because not everybody has a sane mind, you know, yeah. and that's something that we should be grateful for and not, not take it for granted. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? And some people, some people don't have a say, yeah, because some people don't have a sane mind and it's not their fault. It could be a medical condition, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so we have to count our blessings. So I'm just happy to be here to be able to speak with you. And hopefully today I touch somebody's life in some significant way or, you know, a small way. I know you did. I know you did. 
And you know, one thing one thing that I I I, I want to go back to Valentino is 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 the fact that social injustice is a huge part of what placed you in prison. You come out of prison and find that it continues to happen. Last year, the pandemic put a magnifying lens on all these injustices that have been going on for years. So even people who, who knew about it and didn't want to pay attention to it had to see it. Having gone through what you've been through, what are your thoughts about the social injustice that still continues and, in, and, and it includes these incredible numbers in prison of people who've been wrongfully convicted, part of racism? Well, I started a foundation called the Art of Freedom, which fights against not only wrongful convictions, but sentencing reform. Okay, it's the reason why we have over 2.3 million people incarcerated because our sentencing guidelines are too harsh, and excessive, and it violates the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment. Okay, and we have to reach those that can change this problem. Mm -hmm. You know, Congress, the Senate, the President. Okay. And until you reach those lawmakers, then you're going to see the same rhetoric, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's not going to lead to anything significant. All right, we should be ashamed. And yeah. what I would say to these people, if, yeah, what I would say to them, if I'm given an opportunity, and I hope that one day I will be, is where is the humanity? Where's your heart? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the system is not designed or equipped to give the poor person a fair trial. Yep. Now, I'm just speaking on our justice system in, in a sense, okay? But as an overall, overall issue in America with discrimination, bias, prejudice, racism, these type of things that minorities are plagued with, okay? Uh, the only way that these things will end is if laws are changed. There is no other recourse. Okay? Mm -hmm. And how we change these laws is that we must come together collectively. Everyone. I am talking about millions of people. And millions of people must demand change. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's no other way. Because one thing I learned about, and not all politicians are bad, you know, so you have some really good politicians out there, okay? However, they're in the minority, okay? They're the minority, all right? And the only solution is to uh, think of a strategy to get their attention. Because a politician, the average politician, they don't have to see you. They don't have to look at you. No. You know, no. They, they don't have to see you or look at you. They go to work, they go home, and they call it a day. Okay, and that's the problem. That's the problem. It's, it's very clear that we're behind uh, when it comes to the, having compare, compassion, or concern um, for the next race, creed, color, ethnicity, mm -hmm. you know, or even gender. Mm -hmm. We're way behind. Same in the same token that we were behind in slavery, in ending yes. slavery. Yes. Okay. Yes. And it yeah, and also ending ending the Jim Crow laws. Okay. And the only way that we can have a fighting chance to make the world a better place and our justice system more fair, just and equal. Is to hold those accountable that's that's in uh, office or that hold these positions because they're there to serve the people, not themselves. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 so we have to continue standing uh, for our freedom by, yes. like you said, holding people accountable, and you know, 
it, 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 it's an uphill battle in the sense that the more we express our awareness of our freedom, of what, of what we have a right to, the more resistance we encounter. So we really have to support each other to continue going. Yeah, because if there's strength in numbers, mm -hmm. okay, there's strength in numbers. So the more people that you have on the same page, okay, the easier it is to, uh, to get change. Right, right. And, 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 and we, we, need, we need to continue this process that you definitely immersed yourself in uh, as you were learning so much in your, in your readings. Um, we need to learn deeply about our history to really oh, yeah. to recognize our strengths, to, 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 to bring out what we, what we have inside that is so valuable. I mean, just looking at the paintings behind you is such a vivid example of you discovering so much about yourself. Drawings, Melissa. Drawing. Yes. I mean. Yeah, drawings. Everybody says paintings. I, I love it because the whole goal was to make the drawings look like a painting. And it, and, and it does. <laughs> it does. I mean. Thank you. It's, it's really amazing that that moment when, when, when you got busy living, all of this poured forth out of you. We need to help each other get busy living and healing so many wounds we've had for generations. I'm so glad you created the Art of Freedom Foundation. And I know, I know that it will continue to set the tone for our healing. Thank you. That's the goal. It's in progress. Yes, and I and I wrote a book. It took me about five months. I wrote a, I wrote for like six hours a day the last five months. So the book should be released in a couple months. It's called the Art. It's called the Soul of an Unfree Man. Oh, I, I look forward to this. Congratulations. Yeah. Yes, and I and I take I take my readers on I take my readers on. A daily journey of what it was, and you know how it what it took for me to survive a uh, prison, okay. And um, I don't leave anything out. On that note, I'm wondering because you've experienced so many interviews and conversations about what happened while you were in prison, about your art, and I'm wondering if there is something that you would like to, to get across to the community that you have not had an opportunity to share in any of these interviews, something that you want people to know about you? A lot of my interviews just focus on the artwork, mm -hmm. okay? And even when I have extensive interviews done, they cut out everything. They cut out my prison reform work, stuff like that. And it just focuses on the artwork. You know, but that's okay because I have full confidence that my message is going to reach, you know, people and maybe possibly the world. Yes. Um, but that all of us have to, I don't want to focus on myself. And what I want to tell people is this. Whatever you're dealing with right now, you have to never, ever give up. You have, and that's the key to survival, and that's the key to having, you know, a prosperous life, you know, and do not allow uh, any stress, whether it's financial stress, relationship stress, you know, um, health wise, or any of these things that's designed to break the spirit. Because your spirit is going to determine the outcome of everything. And we're all going to leave this planet one day. So don't worry about death either. We can't avoid that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you live your best life. You live your best life until God brings you back to him. That's it. Yes. Thank you so much. 
thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Melissa. It was a, it was a pleasure. It was. It was a pleasure. It was such a pleasure. I thank you for your words. I know these words are going to reach many people. We need to invite each other into reflection so that we can, like you said, live our best life. You know, squeeze the juices out of life with more consciousness. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. Be well. <laughs>